Thank you. I'm applying for the position of the Holy Ghost. Um, and I'll let you know how that goes. Um, when I was a believer, a preacher, and I was a true believer, a lot of Christians try to say, well, Dan, if you really knew Jesus, you would never have left the ministry. But I think I make the point in my book, Godless, that if I was not a true Christian, nobody is. I felt it. I believed it. I prayed. I read the Bible. I dedicated my life. I lived by faith. I preached for 19 years. And I also, when I prayed, I got all these feelings and all this amazing goosebumps. And I knew God was real. Have any of you ever had that experience? Some of you went to church, right? Yeah, so it's a real thing that's happening in the brain. In fact, I can still do it now. I, can, I won't do it right here, but I can, I can still... <laughs> I can still go out behind the barn and uh, speak in tongues and all this, whoa. Some of you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, right? Some of you wonder, huh? You sat in church and you were kind of like, people are, what? what are they feeling? Some of you were like my father-in-law, who, by the way, was born and raised right here in Springfield, Missouri. Annie Laurie's, Annie Laurie Gaylor is my wife, and that's her dad. And his mother was Christian church. His parents were Christian church. She said she never saw a church she didn't like. Oh, what a beautiful building. Annie Laurie now says she's never seen a ruined church that she doesn't like. <laughs> but her dad used to sit in church, and he would kind of like, he was like seven or eight, and he was going to church, and he was looking around, and then it dawned on him, my parents are nuts. <laughs> they actually believe this stuff, you know? He said, I thought it was just like we were going to, but they actually think it's real. Well, I did. I was one of those nuts. I was one of those people that really thought it was true, and I knew it was true, and I thought, how sad for you skeptics to miss out on something so precious, so real. In the introduction to my book, Godless, Richard Dawkins writes, and I, I think this is a compliment. Uh, he says, Dan Barker is the most eloquent witness of internal delusion that I know. And he's right about that. It is a delusion, and it's a very powerful, very real thing. And when you have it, and you're experiencing it, and you're feeling it, and you're getting goosebumps, and you're feeling the joy of Jesus and the peace that passes understanding, and you, you think, boy, you know, it's, it's your lucky day. You don't know it, you skeptics, but it's your lucky day when God directs you to sit next to me on that bus, you know? <laughs> I was that guy. You've all met the guy. And and it was powerful, it was, it was life-changing, and I spent 19 years preaching. And uh, all the while, I didn't realize that goosebumps are not evidence of the Holy Spirit. Goose, goosebumps are evidence of evolution, did you know that? Why do you get goosebumps? What good are they? Yeah, but what good are they to us? They're no good, right? They're, what are they, is that called an atavism or whatever? Uh, uh, our hairier ancestors used the fur, would fluff up when it, for thermal control, or to look larger to scare off a predator, right? You're being attacked. You've seen animals do that. So we get these goosebumps, not because they do us any good, but because they did our ancestors some good. There's one evidence of evolution right there. But I used to think it was the Holy Spirit was powerful and real, and, and I thought, how sad. You people, you don't know what you're missing out on. Why would you not want to participate in something so beautiful, so real, so powerful, so amazing? And uh, I understand the feeling of those who are out preaching because it's a very powerful, real experience in the mind. And I know atheists who doubt. I know there are atheists who think that we believers were just pretending. You know, oh, you couldn't, you were just talking yourself into it. I wasn't just pretending. The brain was doing something. And I think, and I'm not, I'm not an expert, maybe somebody can study this, but I think you know how all these characteristics that we have vary across the population, and it's good that they do uh, for, for a species survivability. Uh, your height, your skin color, your eye color, your metabolism, their, your you know, musical abilities, different things that we all vary from. I think this thing that we might call susceptibility to mysticism varies also. My, my father-in-law and James Randi, James Randi never felt a thing. Uh, I had breakfast with him in Denmark last year, and uh, I said, hey, J hey James Randi, uh, you're a magician. Can you make religion disappear? <laughs> and he nodded his head and quickly said, yes, I can, but you can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> so if we could afford to raise the money and have James Randi. But, um, uh, Richard Dawkins, who put on the helmet, actually, nothing, right? Other people put on the helmet. 
Oh, you see, you feel it and you see it. Well, I think I happen to be one of those people that's way over here on this tail end of that, whatever that curve is. And some of you are way over here. And I think that just shows that some of us tend to be naturally more religious. We fall for it. We, uh, uh, we believe it. We feel it. The fact that I can repeat it right now, I can actually talk with God right now in my brain, and I can feel it. There's this like, uh, like a parental feeling up here, calming me, relaxing me, telling me things are fine, and I just get all integrated. And it feels wonderful. And I think there's probably some chemical thing, too, that happens. When you eat chocolate, uh, when, you're, when you're making love, uh, when you're doing a good deed, there's things that happen to the cerebellum in the brain. And I think with a religious experience, it must be because it felt great. I mean, it feels great to do it. Uh, but I realize now, of course, after thinking and studying that none of that points to anything outside of the brain. It points to a very powerful, creative, imaginative, delusional brain. And when you're in that moment, it's just something to live for. It's like, like I play jazz piano. On, on the weekends uh, in jazz combos. And sometimes when it's the right band, is there a piano on the stage by any chance? There's not, is there? That would have been cool. Um, <laughs> when it's the right band, it's the right musicians in the right place, there are these moments that happen where suddenly we're just looking at each other and we're going, whoa. And it's, it's like this illusion that happens that the song is something bigger than the sum of its parts. We're playing less, but we're making more. There's this magical thing that happens. It's not real magic, but there's this moment to live for. And that's one of the reasons we like to go out and gig and, and do that. Sometimes the audience doesn't even know, but we just know. It's just, but we know it's an illusion. We know that it's a, the brain doing this thing, but it's something amazing. Those of you who are in the arts or who experience, uh, maybe a, a parallel would be if you're at a rock concert or a musical concert or something, you feel like, well, I'm a part of this thing. Well, the brain does that, and it did it with me. All the way up until 1983, when I changed my mind, I realized, uh, you know, I even had to tell God, because I was talking to him, hey, by the way, uh, you don't exist. Um, uh, it sure feels like it, you know, it's like weird. My, my brain, my eyeball is looking around the world at, you know, philosophy and religion and psychology, and, and look at those Hindus, and look at those, oh, look at those Muslims, and look at those, uh, oh, yeah, look at, oh, yeah, and then, and then suddenly the eyeball went like this. Oh. <laughs> to get that context is a hard thing to do. To get outside of yourself, to become your own science experiment, that's a tough thing to do. Some of you did that, right? Some of you were raised religious and you went through that process. It took me four or five years until I finally, in the summer of 83, I knew I no longer believed, but I kept it to myself for four or five hypocritical months when I was still preaching and uh, hated it, and I should have stopped. But how do you stop a lifetime of ministry? So uh, in fact, it was kind of amazing because I would be up before a church preaching, and, and people were saying, amen, and God bless, and hallelujah. And people were coming forward to get saved. There's that old saying that God is so ultimately powerful that even though he doesn't exist, he can still save people. I mean, that, think how powerful that is. Uh, and um, after one of my sermons, a woman came up to me and she said, Reverend Barker, she had like tears in her eyes. I want you to know, I really felt the spirit of God on your ministry tonight. And I'm thinking, you did? No. <laughs> and I knew that I was a phony. I knew that I didn't believe it. I knew I had to stop. And, uh, and yet that tells you something. I'm kind of glad I went through those months of lacking integrity when I should have stopped and I didn't. Uh, that tells you something about this big drama that's being played. The ministers up here, the people in the audience, they're coming to get what they want to get, and it doesn't matter, they're going to feel it anyway. So, um, and it was uh, in the December of 83, I tell the story in my book when I preached my last sermon, and then nine months later, uh, I had never knowingly met any other atheists. I thought I was the only one in the world. I had never spoken publicly about it. Nine months later, uh, after I'd written a letter to Ann Gaylor of the Freedom From Religion Foundation telling my story, I got a phone call from Chicago. This woman says she's a producer of a talk show with a host named Oprah Winfrey, and could you come on the show and tell us your story? And I said, well, that would be kind of fun. Uh, so I did. I flew to Chicago. I was in Los Angeles. And uh, for the, I met Annie Laurie and Ann that, that day, 
In fact, we have a videotape of the day we met. It's kind of neat. We showed our daughter, Sabrina. And there's a moment there where you can see me and Annie Laurie kind of checking each other out, you know, just kind of. <laughs> and uh, Sabrina was laughing when she saw that because the day her parents met, uh, she was laughing, not that we were so young looking, but that audience, Oprah had packed that audience with Bible thumpers and pe people were calling Annie Laurie a witch. And I was really enjoying it. That was not only the first time I had publicly spoken about my atheism, groping for words that now come really easy, but I was just thinking it through then, you know. And, um, but I'd never spoken before a hostile audience either. And there was something energizing about that. I just love talking before a hostile audience. There's just something about, <laughs> it's just, two weeks ago I did a debate in Minnesota uh, with a Muslim. His name was uh, uh, Hamza Tsortsis. And I started the debate, and more than half the crowd at the University of Minnesota were Muslims. I started the debate by saying, you Muslims say, there is no God but Allah. And I have to admit that I agree with the first two-thirds of that sentence. Uh, <laughs> Monday night, I debated um, Father Lucas in Corvallis, Oregon. That was my 98th public debate, by the way. Uh, I, I did my first one in uh, uh, February of 85, and I'm aiming for 100 now, so I think I'm going to get there. Uh, Father Lucas, uh, it was his first debate, and that audience was at least half Catholic. Uh, it was the Socratic Club, which was started by uh, C.S. Lewis. as one of these Christian groups. They called themselves the Socratic Club. And there were at least, what, eight or ten other priests out there in the audience with their collars, and a bunch of nuns, and one nun about the fourth row with blue... She, um, the whole evening, she was glaring at me. And then she was just. <laughs> she, was, she was like right out of central casting. I mean, she was, she was exactly what you would put in a movie for a, a, a fun debate. And I love doing debates. But the first time I'd ever publicly spoken was on that Oprah Winfrey show. And Oprah was great. And it was great TV because that audience was really, you know, mixed up. In fact, I have, I need to put that online because that, that first time of actually talking before anybody it was uh, it was like a magic moment I said I like this this is you know after 19 years of preaching I want to keep preaching I still want to keep you know spreading the gospel those four or five months that I was in the ministry before that and still being a hypocrite were horrible and do you know there are people like that right now there are preachers priests monks nuns that have lost their faith they are now atheists who want to get out of the ministry. And uh, over the years, I've collected stories of former clergy. I have about 25 or 30 friends who used to be preachers who are now out. And um, a few years ago, um, one of them from Norway, Levi Fragel, said, why don't we start a group of some sort of former preachers or, or preachers? Well, then... Uh, Daniel Dennett and his colleague Linda Lascola last year, you may have seen the study they came up with about atheists in the pulpit. Well, some of the men that they found for their study were people that I had found because they'd read Godless, and they write an email or a letter saying, by the way, I'm still in the pulpit, but I don't believe anymore, and I need to get out. What do I do? So I was able to give uh, Dan and Linda six or eight names, and they, they took about three of them and actually went and interviewed these ministers who are still preaching right now who have to get up on Sunday morning, they don't believe it anymore, uh, but they hate what they're saying. And uh, they came out in that first part of the study, and then in uh, this year, they're now working on part two of Ministers, Atheists in the Pulpit. And uh, Richard Dawkins, for a number of years, has talked about, um, after we had our conference in Iceland, he said, we need to do something to help these clergy, atheists that are in the pulpit, but they don't know how to get out or what to do. So. Uh, Dawkins and, and Robin or Elizabeth Cornwell and uh, Linda Lascola and Daniel Dennett and I and a number of others, we started a brand new group that none of you can join. Uh, isn't that nice? Uh, there's so many groups to join, but, uh, but you can join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, by the way. Uh, and we started a group. It started in March of this year called The Clergy Project. And we started with about 52 names. Uh, most of them were former like me, but a few of them were, are still in the ministry. Today, just this morning, we signed up a, a practicing Buddhist monk uh, who's an atheist. We now have 113 people in the group with 
31 of them are active clergy. Uh, there's a guy in Tennessee, his nickname, they all use pseudonyms in the group, and no more than two of us actually know the real identity of these people because their privacy is important. Um, I was telling this story at a debate about a month ago in Indiana uh, that they're having trouble trying to find an exit strategy, and the rabbi during the debate got up and said, it's an easy exit strategy. Get up on Sunday morning and say, I'm an atheist now, and you're all deluded. There's an exit strategy. <laughs> But, but it's really sad. These guys, uh, and, and there's some women too, um, they want to get out and they, it's a timing thing. It's an issue of uh, you know, income, uh, health care, children to support. Who's going to hire somebody with a divinity degree in this economy? You know? What are you going to do? How do you change? So those of us who did make it out, uh, we, we call ourselves alums or former, we are there in this secret invitation only community called uh, the Clergy Project. And Richard Dawkins put up a lot of money to actually make the web page, and it's a pretty neat place. But it's very carefully screened and vetted, so who we, we allow to get in. In fact, some people we can't allow in because they're just, for some reason or other, don't qualify. But then some of them are agonizing, and some of them I haven't told my wife yet, and what are, what are my kids? And, and yesterday my daughter was asking me these questions about God and religion, and I couldn't be honest with my own daughter. I wanted to tell her, you know, what I know about the Bible, but I, but I couldn't. Uh, since March, three of them have graduated. Three of them are now out of the ministry, including Jerry DeWitt, who uh, is helping with rational recovery. Uh, he's a fireball. He left the ministry this summer, uh, Pentecostal in Louisiana, and his income has cut in half, but he couldn't be happier. He says, what's the price of integrity, you know? Uh, others can't do that. Some of them, and we are not judgmental. Some of you might think, well, isn't hypocrisy wrong? Isn't it wrong to be lying? You know, Yes, but sometimes it's like, well, suppose you're going through a, a breakup. When's the moment? You know, Suppose you realize you're, you, you're going to break up or divorce or whatever. Where's that point? You know, So sometimes that point is a tough thing. Uh, another one, uh, Chris was his nickname in, in North Carolina. He just left about a month ago. And he's working for a nonprofit now, so he found some work. That's the big problem with them is what to do, what work to do. So um, I went into computer programming for a few years, which I thought was a blast. I got paid to have so much fun. And then went to work for the Freedom from Religion Foundation in uh, uh, 1980, part-time in 1985, but full-time in 1987. The foundation is growing. This group is growing. Isn't this amazing? Um, what's... The Center for Inquiry Campus Groups, the Secular Student Alliance, has what, 300 and how many, Sarah, do you have? 309. 309, okay, groups uh, that are just spontaneously popping up all over the country. In Australia, there's a, a new group, it's a year old, of campus free thought organizations, and a lot of them thought they were the only one. They realized, oh, there's others? It's kind of neat. This is a bottom-up kind of movement. It's, it's a we the people kind of thing happening here. None of you were forced or asked or, you know, I mean, it wasn't like some pope or some atheist missionary came to your house and, uh, you know, uh, or some bishop of agnosticism, you know, you saw it on TV. It's just us. It's just our own thoughts. And with me, that's the way it was. It was just my own thinking. And when I became an atheist, I didn't even like the word. I didn't know if I would like any other atheist. I didn't, I didn't care. I just wanted to follow the facts wherever they lead. So... Um, uh, I did my first debate in 85 with uh, Rubel Shelley, a Christian church uh, out of Nashville, non-instrumental. I, I did the same thing. I went up on his stage and said, where's the piano? And it was one of those churches where they don't have music in it. And uh, um, enjoy, I guess once a preacher, always a preacher. We're all like that. I used to think the good news, the good news of the gospel is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know what verse that is? John 3.16. 3, you know more than most Christians already, you guys. Um, and I used to get up and think, that's the great news. I wanted to save one more soul before the world ended to keep one more of you from going into hell. If somebody was standing out on the street and they were blind and a truck is rushing toward them, wouldn't you go out and grab them and take them out of harm's way? Well, that's how I saw my ministry. 
The world's ending, hell is real, and you people, don't you want to be taken, don't you want this great message, this great news? I mean, why would you not want something so wonderful? I used to work with Catherine Kuhlman, the faith healer, and I, I saw healings. I saw miracles. Who could possibly deny the power? But I now realize that the supposed good news of the gospel is really just solving a problem of its own making. It's like, how much respect should you have for a doctor who runs around cutting people with a knife so he could sell them a Band-Aid? You know what I mean? So that's kind of what Christianity is. You are rotten. You are doomed. You are horrible. Suppose you were walking by my house one day. You've been walking by for a long time. And I were to go up on the porch and say, hey, stop, I've got some good news. Good news for you people. Stop, stop, stop. You don't have to go down in my basement. <laughs> this is great news. You've been walking by all this time. You've been ignoring me. And I deserve to be recognized and honored. And you've been ignoring me and it's made me so angry. And so mad, and I just get so horribly mad, so I built this torture chamber down in the basement. <laughs> and there's some hooks down there, and there's some sharp things, and there's some vats of sneaky stuff, and there's a furnace, and there's some chains, and it's horrible, and there's flames. But you don't have to go down there. I sent my son down there. <laughs> and... And it was gruesome. I tell you, it was really horrible. But that satisfied my anger. And now <laughs> his blood was shed. And now, I'm, now, now, you, now you're free. You don't have to go down. All you have to do, come on up here. Just come up and tell my son that you love him, and hug him. And then you can move in with us. We'll live up in the attic. And you can, you can tell me how great I am. Uh, you can... You can, you, can just tell, you can just tell me how much you love me, and we'll do that. Won't that be great? So would you keep walking? <laughs> and I thought, I really thought this was wonderful news. I mean, who would not want to hear this good news of the gospel? But uh, it's a morally bankrupt system. Any system of thought that has to use a threat of violence to make its point to any degree, and what is hell? It's a threat of physical violence. In the Quran, it's even worse. Have you ever heard people say, what if you're wrong? You know, like Pascal's wager. Um, what have you got to lose because you might, what, you might, what if there is a hell? Well, with that kind of thinking, this Pascal's wager kind of thinking, what you should do is pick the religion with the worst hell in it. Because <laughs> you should pick Islam. Um, because what if your Christians die and it's, it's that's, what have you got to lose? In, in the Quran, which I read again in, two different English translations for this debate I did. Um, hell is this, it depends on what verse you read. Sometimes it's a freezing place. Sometimes it's a hot place. But uh, we infidels, me, uh, and I told this to Hamza, you know, I said, I'm just because I disagree with you, because I am not faithful to your God, the skin's going to burn off my arms, off my, and it's going to be horrible. But Allah's going to come and grow it back again so he can burn it off again and again and again and again forever. While you Muslims, you faithful believers, are going to be sitting up on these purple couches under the fig trees with these dewy-eyed maidens sitting next to you, and you'll be looking down at us and laughing. You'll be, that's what the Quran says. You'll be laughing at us for that. And, um, and I said, and you're trying to tell the world about morality. You think you have a moral system, right? Um, and uh, I, in fact, I debated a guy a couple years ago in Colorado, uh, a Muslim imam. And when I told that story about the skin and the, and the Muslims will be looking down laughing, in front of that whole crowd, he went. <laughs> he did. He was happy about that. He thought it was a great thing that I was actually preaching his, his book, the, the Threat of Hell, The Fear of Hell. So um, in debates that I do on morality, uh, last Monday was morality. Uh, uh, Father Lucas uh, was arguing that there has to be an absolute basis for morality. He argued that there has to be an absolute basis, but he never said what it was or how you decide moral questions. He never did that. He just said there just has to be. And uh, in my opening statement, I at least gave one 
humanistic way of actually making moral decisions. Uh, in which, um, and so he, he failed to make that point. But apparently, according to Father Lucas and many believers, morality is from a list of rules. It's a bunch of commandments. You follow the orders. That's how you know what's good. This father figure in my brain is like what a toddler feels. Tell me what to do, Daddy. You know, Tell me how to live. And in, in, in one of Dawkins' books, he points out that he thinks that with many people, religion is just a form of retarded or arrested development because you never get out of that toddler stage, that sort of pre-conventional stage of morality where you just need to be told to you all the time. Supposedly, the Ten Commandments, the great, wonderful gift to our species that was never seen. In fact, you couldn't even look at it unless you were a Levite. You couldn't even know it was there in this ark. God supposedly wrote with his finger. It says in the Bible, he wrote the finger of God on this tablet. Moses got mad and he busted him, so he had to go back and make another set. But um, <laughs> if that's such an important thing, why didn't God like engrave it on the moon or something? You know, <laughs> here's the rules. Here's how you must live. But those rules, you know, in the Big Ten, of course, the first four have nothing at all to do with morality or how we treat each other. Uh, the Sabbath, for example, is one of the rules. Uh, honor the Sabbath. Because God's, for some reason, the number seven's important. Who knows why, but it's important to God. And so one day out of seven, maybe because of the phases of the moon. Um, but um, the Bible tells us what happens if you don't uh, honor the Sabbath. There was a man in the book of Numbers, uh, and I used to preach from this book, and I didn't see it like this, but there's a man, the Israelites spotted this guy outside the camp. You know what he was doing? You know what horrible crime he was doing? He was picking up sticks on the Sabbath. <gasps> and so what do we do with this guy? Who knows? You were paying attention in Sunday school, right? <laughs> well, why would anybody be picking up sticks in the first place? Maybe to make a fire or who knows what. But does anyone in this room think there's something morally wrong about picking up sticks? But it was on the Sabbath. So they got the guy and they said, what do we do with him? What do we? So they went to Moses. Moses, what do we do with this guy? And Moses talked with God and God said, yep, he's got to die. <laughs> This is from the good book, the moral teaching of the good book. And it's straight out of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the biggies. So they took him outside and they stoned him to death with stones that he died. Why did they phrase it like that? But anyway, they could have just said they stoned him to death. But um, um, the Ten Commandments were so important. You know, there's a story in 1 Samuel 6. Um, for a while, the Philistines had captured the Ten Commandments. Kind of like capture the flag, you know. You... Uh, <laughs> They grabbed it and they took it to their, their more to the, to the west. And they had this thing for, I forget how long, six months or a year. But it bugged them because then all these plagues were happening to them. And they thought, oh no, should we really be careful what you wish for? They had this, this holy, the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Covenant was, it would be like our, our constitution. You know how it would be like a, pre, it would be like the most precious thing of any country. And it was stolen from the Israelites. And the Philistines had it. But they had second thoughts because they were having all these things happened to them and they thought, you know, maybe this God of this Ten Commandments is punishing us. We should maybe give it back, but how do we do that? So uh, they came up with a scheme. They made this cart and they had these two cows uh, on the cart who had just given birth and they put the Ark of the Covenant on the back of this cart. You can read this story. Um, and then they, make, they made these golden, uh, a golden tumor and a golden rat, I think. Anyway, they were supposed to be like an offering to give back, to apologize that we took your most holy national document, you know. And they said, if God wants, if there really is a God and he wants the Israelites to have their precious Ten Commandments back, well then, instead of the cows going to their crying babies, like any cow would do, the cow will take it back. Well, it did. The cow started heading straight back to the Israelite area. And as it approached this one village, I guess it was, or town. It's called Beth Shemesh, which actually means the house of, house of Shamash, which was a Babylonian god. So maybe the reason why the, the Israelite Jewish writer wrote that was to get back at that pagan god, but we don't know for sure. But here comes this cart pulled by these cows with this thing on the back of it. And there's these farmers outside, and they're looking, and they're saying, what's that? 
what is that? And as it gets closer, what is that? Praise God. Look, it's coming back. The Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments that tells us all how to live. It's coming back. They were happy. Who wouldn't be happy? They'd be like, wow, this is great. This is, our, this is what we're all about. It got closer, and they looked, and they, they, it is. It is the Ten Commandments. So they, they broke up the cart, and they built a fire, and they killed the cows to sacrifice the cows to God because God needs to have smoke in his nostrils, the Bible says. And... Um, <laughs> They were just really, really pleased, and they were praising and worshiping because now it came back. And you know what God did? You know what happened? He killed those farmers. Why? They weren't supposed to touch it and look at it. They weren't supposed. And some scholars think, well, this was just the story was made up to keep, to keep people from looking into the ark because they, everybody knew there's nothing there. I mean, there's <laughs> don't don't look, right? It's empty. Because why don't we have those stones now? Where are those tablets? You know, and wouldn't that be something that they would have and could have preserved? Or what? But, uh, and then it says, not only were those 70 people, so 70 farmers killed, but 50,000 people in Beth Shemesh were also killed. 50,000 people. Well, that's one of the ways we know the story's a myth, because there was no town in that area at that time in history that had 50,000 people. Jerusalem was the big town in that area, had maybe four to 6,000 at that time. Uh, some scholars think that that 50,000 was a translation error. It was really just 70. It's not so bad. God just killed 70, you know. <laughs> but um, it, it, if it is a translation error, what does that tell you about the reliability of the Bible? Right there. So, um, suppose one of my kids Suppose Sabrina, when she was a little girl, had written me a birthday card, and it said, Daddy, I love you. And she spelled the word love, L-U-V. And suppose I were to say, Sabrina, you made a mistake. And besides, you call me father, not daddy. That's disrespectful. You need to call me father. This is how you properly show your respect for your parent. 50,000 people in Springfield have to die. That's the good book. That's the, the moral teachings from the book. That His ego, the whole system of, of the Bible, the Bible's not a moral manual. There's some teachings in the Bible, of course, the golden rule and love your neighbor, and even those have their qualifications. Uh, but the Bible is a salvation book. It's not about how to be good to others. It's about how to get out of, get out of hell, how to get out of the basement, basically, and how to get to live up in the attic with the God forever. That's what, basically what the whole thing is. And the measure of morality in that book is not human needs and human wants, which we call humanism. Um, whatever our needs and wants in human nature are is what we think, we skeptics think, the measure of morality should be. That which is harmful is that which we try to avoid. The measure of morality in the Bible, if there is such a thing, is the glory and the honor of the father, the dictator. If, if, if I told Sabrina when she was a little girl, you shouldn't run out into the street. Stop. And we all do that as parents, right? Because humans go through moral development and through, we think things through. And babies, human babies are born way premature compared to others. So we need at least a few years of the parental guidance and for the brain to, in, to develop in all these ways, in language and in moral development stuff. So, and suppose Sabrina said, well, why shouldn't I run out in the street, Daddy? And I were to say, because I said so. I'm your father and you must respect me. And if you run out in the street, you are disobeying my orders and that offends my ego. You should never do that. Is that the, is that the basis for morality? The ego and the will of the, of the parent figure? Is that why we're supposed to be good? Well, if you're a one-year-old and a two-year-old, you kind of feel that way, don't you? Maybe you can't put two and two together. You can't develop any kind of moral philosophy. And do we ever, I mean, do, at any age of life, do we ever fully understand all of our moral instincts in that? Um, but in any event, the measure for morality for that kind of a dictatorial system is the will and the ego of the parent. And that's what the Bible is. The whole Bible is basically measuring up to his holiness, his goodness, the day of the week that he wants to be worshipped, what kind of language you can speak, and in some religions, how women should dress or whether... Paul even says women should not wear gold in church. Did you know that in the Bible? 
And yet how many women ignore that? I mean, wedding rings, I mean, gold in church. And you're not supposed to do that according to the Bible. So the morality of the Bible is really a non-morality. It's just an obedience manual. You follow the rules, you follow the orders. I think that all religions have good teachings in them. I think we all agree. I was invited to, um, uh, in Canada, it was called the World Religions, the World Religions Conference. They had a Muslim and a, a Buddhist and a Native American spiritualist and a Catholic and a, a number of, a Hindu, and they wanted an atheist, which I thought was pretty neat. They wanted an atheist there also. And I said, I can't come because atheism is not a religion. I can't go to a World Religions Conference. And they said, well, what if we call it World Religions and Philosophy? I said, all right. So I went. Um, and the topic was salvation. So each of these respective religious traditions was explaining their perspective on salvation. And so what's an atheist going to say about salvation? And I basically said that thing about the doctor with a knife, that really salvation is solving a problem of its own making, because sin is just a phony concept. Sin just means missing God's mark of holiness. Hamartia means to miss, to miss the mark. And so what I said was, I think there's a teaching of Jesus that I actually agree with. Jesus said, people who are well don't go to the doctor. It's only people who are sick who go to the doctor. And I said, there you go. We atheists and agnostics don't view ourselves as sick. We don't view ourselves as damned. We don't view ourselves as corrupt and degraded. We view ourselves as well, thank you. So my take on, on salvation, and, they, and a reporter put it in the paper the next day, my take was this. If salvation is the cure, then atheism is the prevention. Just, just don't get sick in the first place. Just don't, don't think that there's something wrong with you. Which, uh, so you, you see these preachers that come up to you and they think that they imagine there's something wrong with you and you know there's something wrong with you, right? Because they think the whole human race, original sin or whatever you want to call it, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, uh, that we are all infected with this imperfection. Uh, we can just hold our heads up and say, I, you're the one with the problem, not me. I'm not... You know, what, why are you preaching at me? I should be preaching at you. There's a better way. Um, although perhaps there are some people over on this end of the bell curve who are still morally maybe needing a crutch. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, would we rather have an alcoholic sober than not believing that there's a higher power? I think we would. We'd rather have them, even though we think the higher power is just here, not outside of the universe. Uh, if some people are like that and they need that, well, then who are, we're not a threat to them. It's not like we're barging into their churches and dragging them out of their pews. Um, our organization doesn't do that. I think we see across all the religions a sort of common humanity is what you see. If any of us, religious or not, are going to judge all these religions, by what measure are we judging? We're judging it by something outside of the religions. We say, oh, that's a good religion, that's a bad one, that's a good one, that's a bad one. I like that one, I don't like that one. And you'll see a commonality. You'll see, uh, surprise, surprise, a religion talks about peace. You know, like it's a big thing. It's like this religion introduced this concept. Uh, love, um, community, sharing, cooperation, those things are not religious values. Those are human values. And the fact that they show up across almost every religion shows that they are something that transcends the religions. Those values that are good, uh, the golden rule wasn't unique to Christianity, we all know that. The prohibition against killing in the Ten Commandments, it wasn't like the human race was so stupid, we're sitting, should we kill or shouldn't we? We need somebody, to, oh, should, uh, oh, there's something wrong with killing? Oh, I didn't know, you know, it's like we're so stupid, we needed these tablets. And by the way, when I drove to Corvallis, um, last week to do that debate. I drove along the Columbia River. I had a whole day Sunday to just drive and see how that gorge, how beautiful it is. And I just read in Scientific American that um, now we think Native Americans were on this continent not just 12,000, but 15 and a half thousand years ago. It's been pushed back. Well, that Columbia Gorge was cut about 15,000 years ago. So there might have been human observers of that entire gorge being cut uh, that whole time. I bought a necklace for Annie Laurie, uh, a green, uh, gas bite necklace, which was made by a Native American. Uh, Donna Trachi was her name. 
And uh, she comes from an unbroken line of people who have lived in that area on this continent at least 10,000 years before the Israelites invented the Ten Commandments. They were on this continent living, and, and I asked Father Lucas, are you trying to tell me that those people didn't feel love for their children? They didn't have altruism. They didn't have empathy. They didn't understand cooperation and sacrifice and giving. They didn't grieve over deaths. They didn't, they didn't have natural human instincts toward compassion and goodness. Uh, how, how dare you insult the human race by saying that it was only a couple thousand years ago that we somehow learned what it means to be moral. So if you subtract out of all these religions those common things that we would call good, and we're calling them good by human measure, you know, the, the, by measuring against humanity, whatever those things are, if you subtract them out and realize those are human values that we all possess either instinctively or sometimes rationally through a moral process as we get older, uh, what are you left with? You're left with purely religious teachings, not just moral teaching, but with religious teachings. The Atlanta Journal and Constitution has a weekly page called Religion and Ethics, admitting that there's a difference. Uh, <laughs> So if you take out the ethics, take out what's common to all of us, what you're left with are religious teachings like what day of the week you should worship, how women should dress, what kind of language you can speak, what kind of rituals you'll do. You're left with religious teachings, and religious teachings are not moral or even immoral or amoral. Religious teachings are usually just divisive. They are markers, the in-group versus the out-group. Uh, they create an unnecessary source of social conflict. In a world where there's already plenty of reasons for conflict, religion tends to make this artificial thing, uh, the saved versus the damned, the chosen versus the Gentiles, the, the born-agains versus the... You know, then we're, we are the insight. And I felt it. When I was a preacher, I felt it. We born-again, evangelical, Bible-believing Christians, we had something special. We are the full humans. And everybody else is lacking in some way. The rest of you are somehow... Something's wrong with you, skeptics. Something's wrong because you're not embracing the fullness of life. And so I even felt that dynamic. When I was with other Christians, I felt relaxed and welcomed. And I think it happens in all cultures. Jews with other Jews. I play Some of the bands I play in, we play at bar mitzvahs and at weddings. And you can see that community and that love that Jews have with other Jews. There's that bonding that's kind of neat when you use that group tribal thing. But what it does is it sets up an in-group versus out-group. And religion by itself separating out all the good values is not good. Now I'm going to give you a math quiz, okay? See, see if you can dust off your high school math. This is going to be a tough equation that you need to solve. Religion plus good works equals good works. <laughs> now solve that equation. Good works is good works. And even we atheists and agnostics, we admit that people should be judged by their actions. We don't care if somebody believes in God or wants to stand on their head and pray in tongues to Mother Goose or whatever they want to do. It's a free country. Uh, in our organization, we are often joined by believers, good believers. I think most Christians, most Muslims, Jews are good people. And it, it shouldn't really bother us if they have irrational beliefs if... It's not affecting their daily lives. And there are some people like that. Not the fundamentalists. The fundamentalists are a problem. The right-wingers really are a problem because they try to force that then, their absolutistic thinking on a gray area world. And it doesn't fit. You can't fit a binary brain on a, what do you call it? What's the quantum bit called? A qubit? Uh, you can't fit it on that. It just doesn't match. And so you get, that's why when you're talking with the fundamentalists, you sometimes feel like it's a different language. You don't, what, what, why aren't we talking the same language? Well, because they don't allow for this gray, middle, relativistic, situational, contrafactual kind of stuff. It all has to be hot or cold. The Bible says that. You should be hot or cold or I'll spit you out of my mouth. Right or wrong, good or bad, black or white. It's all a binary brain kind of thing. But most Christians are not like I was. Most of them are more in the middle and more liberal, and they're good people, and we march shoulder to shoulder in civil rights marches and... Um, gay rights, uh, abortion rights, birth control, you'll find, in fact, that's one of the evidences that an absolutistic uh, revelation morality doesn't work because take any social issue of the day that we're struggling with right now. Doctor-assisted suicide, stem cell research, uh, abortion rights. What are some of the others? Um, 
gay marriage and what else? The war. You find devout, church-going, Bible-believing Christians on both sides of those issues, don't you? You find them marching on both sides. And Paul wrote in the Bible, God is not the author of confusion. But can you think of a book that's caused more confusion than the Bible, you know? Well, I just want to end with a, a plea uh, to help us keep state and church separate. The foundation is growing, just like this group is growing. The SSA, CFI groups are growing. I, something's happening in this country, which is pretty amazing, and you get to be a part of it. How many of you are going to be here for the 44th Skepticon uh, and see what a crowd we're going to have then? We started with... Um, we started with three people on a dining room table in the 1970s, and now we're over 17,000 members. We just hired our fourth full-time attorney, Andrew Seidel, who's from Colorado, and he's really excited to be working as an attorney on state church. He's, you know, he just started uh, November. He started on uh, Halloween Day, actually. And uh, our staff is over 13 full-time, plus a bunch of part-time. We don't have room. We have, to, we have to either move or expand the building, and we're in the process of trying to decide what to do. But with a larger legal staff, and we usually have two to four interns as well, we can accomplish a lot more, such as getting that arm cut off the water tower cross in uh, Whiteville, Tennessee, uh, stopping, stopping football prayers over the loudspeakers in, in Bell County, Kentucky, in DeSoto County, Mississippi, and um, stopping prayers at council meetings. And, um, and many of our victories you don't have to go to court on. Our, our attorneys now know that we can stop a lot by just sending a letter and informing them. In Hamilton County, Tennessee, where, uh, where Chattanooga is, we sent a letter to the superintendent saying, by the way, they shouldn't be praying at high school football games, and here's the reason why. This is a slam dunk. It's already been decided. This is the Supreme Court. You can't take it to the Supreme Court because it's already been taken. So the uh, superintendent of the schools looked at the letter and said, hmm, they're right, and, and conferred with the, this, this, the uh, district uh, attorney who said, yeah, they're right. We can't do that. Besides that, we have a policy that says they can't do that. So, so he sent a memo out to all the schools saying, no more prayers over the football game loudspeakers. And boy, did that cause a firestorm. You can imagine. People, people the next Friday went down to the Ray County versus Hamilton County or whatever the school, and they, and they didn't like prayer being taken away. So a whole bunch of parents ran down to the 50-yard line and said, said the Lord's Prayer. Really, like, We're going to pray anyway. You know, they, and they wear all these T-shirts. And... and they don't understand. We don't care about that. That's free speech. <laughs> Do that. Like in Whiteville, where Steve was telling me in Whiteville, when, when we won that thing about the cross and the water tower, that all these people are putting crosses in their front yards, like they're going to show us. Well, fine. That's your speech. There's a difference between free speech and government speech. And a lot of people don't understand that. So if you see a violation in your area at any level, from the high school principal to the mayor or to the, you know, the county executive, you can contact us. And a lot of the homework's already been done. A lot of the legal precedent, we have template letters all ready to go that we can just sort of fill in the blanks. Because the same things happen over and over and over again. And maybe you're afraid to be identified in your town, but we can at least say we have members in, our, in that area complaining about it. And often it stops it. Last year, our legal staff sent out about 490 letters, just letters, without going to court. We also are in court on a lot of issues. I don't have time to tell you about the, um, the parsonage exclusion that ministers of the Gospels don't have to report their housing as an income. It vastly lowers their tax liability. We're suing over that because we think it's unfair. Why shouldn't other nonprofits like us or the Red Cross or other groups, why shouldn't they who are doing good works also benefit from that? So... Um, And it's too long of a story, but basically what we did was to guarantee that we have standing. The Executive Council of the Freedom from Religion Foundation has granted uh, a housing allowance to me and Annie Laurie. So we now have an official house. It doesn't change anything. It's just on paper. But now we can say, hey, I used to get it when I was a minister, and now I don't. I used to preach for God, and I got this tax break. Now I'm preaching against God, and I don't. Why is that fair? Is, the government, is it fair for the government to take sides in that issue? 
But out of those 490 some letters we sent, 88 of them were victories. 88 victories just with a letter um, advising them that they're breaking the law. And once in a while, this is nice, the attorney or somebody will call us and thank us. Maybe not in your county, but, <laughs> but they will send it. Thanks for bringing this to our attention. We want to obey the law. So uh, uh, contact us online or, or write us a letter or give us a phone call if you have something that you need help with in your area. Helping to, uh, I, I think, the best hope for America uh, obviously would be a secular populace, but short of that, a secular government. If the government remains secular, then we are all truly free. Thanks.